The Supreme Court handed down a judgment two days ago on the 5th of July 2023 to set out what is the correct test for the use of self-defence by a police officer. The judgment is 46 pages long, very complex, talking about a very finely balanced issue, but I'm going to attempt to simplify it for you so that you can understand what the principle was all about. Now this was regarding a police officer who used lethal force and was then subject to an investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Now this decided that whilst the officer did believe that they were in imminent danger and that that belief was honestly held, it was found to be unreasonable and therefore the officer had a case to answer for gross misconduct. So how can this come about when self-defence should normally be understood to be about what you genuinely believe the case to be and then going on to consider whether the use of force is reasonable and proportionate? Now this essentially boils down to two very subtly different tests and it's which of those tests that the Supreme Court decided on. So allow me to simplify and then I'll refer to the judgment for a little bit more detail and then hopefully summarize it in a digestible piece. So we have two tests for self-defense. We have the criminal version of the test for self-defense and we have the civil version of the test for self-defense. Many people might be thinking, how can a civil test apply for self-defense? Well, as I've said many times before, wherever there's a crime, there's usually a parallel civil wrong that goes with it such as criminal damage, the value of whatever it was that was damaged, and in self-defense, if there was an assault, very simply put, in civil cases, it is a tort of battery. And so there is a parallel action in tort. But there is still a civil defense to the tort of battery, but it's a very subtly different test to be applied. Now, the question for the court in this case is which of those tests applies to the situation of an officer and the use of force. So let's have a look at the two tests and spot the very subtle difference between the two of them. This is summarized very neatly at paragraphs 31 and 32 of this judgment, which I'll link in the description below. First of all, it says under the criminal test, the first limb is addressed on the basis of the facts subjectively understood by the individual. However, if the individual has made a mistake of fact, then the more unreasonable the mistake, the less likely it would be that the individual genuinely believed that fact. So it's sort of on a sliding scale and it's a mixture of subjective and objective test within that limb itself. First of all, subjectively, what did the individual believe? And if it was mistaken, how unreasonable was it objectively? And that will inform whether or not the individual can rely on that mistake of fact, because the case in question did involve a mistake of fact. There was no uh, weapon found afterwards, but that was the genuine belief in that situation. In this way, this paragraph goes on, an objective assessment may inform whether there was a genuinely held subjective belief. So far as the second limb, the response, the use of force under the criminal test is concerned, the objective standard of reasonable force is to be assessed using the background of the facts subjectively understood by the individual. There are therefore both objective and subjective elements. Now this differs very slightly from the civil test, which reads as follows, and then I will summarize afterwards. Paragraph 32 provides under the civil test, the first limb, the trigger, the trigger for the use of force, is addressed on the basis the facts as subjectively understood by the individual. However, under the civil test, if an individual made a mistake of fact, he can only rely on that fact if the mistake was a reasonable one to have made. And so cutting off there, that is the main principal difference between the two. In criminal cases and under the criminal test for self-defense, an individual can rely on their honest belief, even if they were mistaken. And then the more unreasonable the mistake, the less likely the individual would genuinely believe that fact. Whereas in the civil test, it is a higher standard with a lower cutoff point, if you like. Because where the individual has made a mistake of fact, he can only rely on that if it was a reasonable one to have made. So it's an earlier cutoff point in a way and a higher standard to prove. So therefore it's going to be a much more difficult test to satisfy to rely on self-defense where the civil standard is applied. Now it was which of these two tests that applied in the case of police disciplinary proceedings that the Supreme Court had to decide on. 
The officer appealed against the decision of the Court of Appeal, arguing that the criminal law test applies to police disciplinary proceedings, with which the Metropolitan Police Commissioner agreed, whereas the decision against the officer relying on the civil test said that the officer had a case to answer for misconduct. And the result of this judgment is that the Supreme Court dismissed the appeal by the officer, unanimously finding that the test to be applied in disciplinary proceedings in relation to the use of force by a police officer in self-defense is the civil law test, which, as I said, is going to be a more difficult test to satisfy where a police officer is relying on self-defense in the use of force in the event that they are mistaken. Now, as I said, I can't go through all of the reasoning in a very short video because this judgment was 46 pages long and even the summary on the official website for the Supreme Court is in itself eight points long in its reasoning, even for the summary of the judgment on the website and for use in press releases. So this is obviously a very complex and nuanced argument going through a very lengthy judgment. But in essence, the bottom line is it is more difficult now with this Supreme Court ruling for a police officer to rely on self-defense in the event that they are mistaken in terms of fact because they must show that it was a reasonable mistake to make rather than they genuinely believed it and then only assessing on how reasonable that mistake was to make and whether or not that informed the decision as to whether they genuinely believed that fact in the first place. I hope that makes sense, although I am quite tired. It's been quite a long day. Uh, this is quite a long judgment, but I hope that makes some kind of sense. But either way, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions following up on this, so please do leave those in the comments box below. Make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you next time.